Hello and welcome to my channel. It's so nice of you to be there. I hope you're doing well. My name is Juan and today I'm here to talk about some great Victorian novels. I have chosen a total of nine books that I think represent Victorian literature in all its possibilities. Now, I like some of these novels better than others, but I wanted to make my choice as wide as possible so all of you can find something that will appeal to you, your taste and your personal interests. But before I go into the 10 books that I have selected for you today, I want to say a word about the books that I have not included. So last week I made a video with my recommendations for autumn and I included a handful of Victorian novels uh, in those recommendations. Perhaps I should plan my videos a bit better, but regardless, uh, because I don't want to repeat myself by talking about books that I discussed only last week, I have been forced to exclude the following novels from this video. Jane Eyre, Wuthering Heights, Frankenstein, and The Picture of Durham Great. All those four novels are great Victorian novels and they are among my favorites. And if you want to know why I recommend them, all you need to do is check out my autumn recommendations and I'm linking to that up here somewhere. But I won't talk about those four books today. Okay, now that I got that out of the way, let's talk about Victorian literature. But before I go into the books themselves, and why I recommend them, I think I must answer the following question. What do we mean by Victorian literature in the first place? The first thing to say about that is that some 19th century books uh, are not Victorian. So the Victorian era does not encompass the whole century, okay? Also, Victorian literature only refers to English literature, although some of the most famous writers were Scottish or Irish but the term Victorian applies to Britain and its colonies since it was coined after the English monarch Queen Victoria. So Queen Victoria's reign covered most of the 19th century, but not the whole century. It covered exactly between 1837 to 1901. So Victorian literature refers to English or more widely British literature written during her reign, known as the Victorian era. It so happens that the period was one of uh, economic prosperity and uh, industrialization in Britain. So a time of fast and profound change too. And many works of Victorian literature reflect or comment on those socio-economic changes and that's what makes them fascinating. But the Victorian era was also characterized by extremely conservative values uh, linked to Christianity. Victorian literature continues to be read to this day there is still a fascination for that era that I sometimes find a little bit hard to understand, to be honest. Uh, I, for one, wouldn't want to live in any past era, but if I had to choose one, I don't think Victorian times would be top of my list, okay? So I don't read 19th century English literature out of some vague romantic notion that those years were a great time to be alive. I don't do that, but I do believe that some of the best novels in English were actually written in the Victorian era. There are also many great Victorian novels, so many of them that it is hard to name just nine, so the list could go on and on, but it has to start somewhere. So let's start with Great Expectations by Charles Dickens. So many, if not all the novels I'm going to talk about today first came out in installments over several months. Uh, Great Expectations was first published between 1860 and 1861, so bang in the middle of the Victorian era. I think that Great Expe Expectations is my favorite novel um, by Dickens. And what is wonderful is that even though there are many, many movie and TV adaptations of this novel, I haven't seen any. And if I have, somehow I have managed to forget them all. So. My memories of the story and this novel come from reading the actual book and are entirely fueled by my imagination. And I much prefer that to any movie. But then again, I'm not that keen on literary movie or TV adaptations. Uh, the books are always better, you know, that's a fact. But I digress. So what is Great Expectations? Um, it is a coming of age story of one character named Pip who is extremely 
um, you know, he's an extremely poor orphan boy who grows up in Kent, which is an English county near London, you probably know that. Eventually, Pip moves to London thanks to the help he receives from an anonymous benefactor. Who that person is will remain a secret for much of the novel. And that is all I'm going to say about the plot in this video. So, Great Expectations is a long novel and a lot happens in it. The plot is full of dramatic turns and twists. So, it can be a lot of fun to read, actually. The novel is also a love story involving people from different social classes, and that's always fun to read. Uh, Pip starts life at the bottom of the social stair, or the social ladder, but he will do all he can to go up in life for love. But how possible was it to move up the social ladder in Victorian times? Will Pip ever become a true gentleman, despite his very humbled origins? Life will teach the ambitious Pip many lessons in the course of this novel. So, if you want to take a look into how social classes worked in Victorian England while also reading a compelling story, then read Great Expectations. Now, the next novel I have uh, for you is Vanity Fair by William uh, Makepeace Thackeray. Although this novel first came out um, between 1847 and 1848, it is set a few decades earlier. Vanity Fair is set during the Napoleonic Wars that took place between 1803 and 1815 in Europe. So this is a Victorian novel set in the 19th century, but before the reign of Queen Victoria, okay? Vanity Fair is a sprawling narrative, but to me, the best thing about it is Becky Sharp, one of the main characters in the novel. Now, Becky Sharp is a social climber and an anti-heroine, an anti-heroine. She's not a character that readers are supposed to look up to at all, and yet, it is impossible to read Vanity Fair and not like Becky Sharp. I feel like it must be a lot easier for most writers to create a likeable, sympathetic character, but I do admire anyone who could write a despicable character like Becky Sharp and make readers like her. And I think that's the best thing about Vanity Fair, if I'm honest. But, you know, some people like Victorian literature because of its gothic, scary stories. So I have a couple of uh, great suggestions for that. Now, the first one of which is Dracula by Bran Stoker, the famous novel from 1897 that brought us Count Dracula. Dracula is a classic because, like all classics, it still speaks to us. What you have in this novel is a foreign force represented by Count Dracula that comes to England, this is an English novel, and tries to destroy English society. So we are dealing here with a foreign threat, in this case coming from Eastern Europe. The main characters in this novel need to stop Dracula to save England. So, I think, you know, this is a nationalistic novel in a way. Now, Count Dracula must be destroyed to preserve the nation. The stakes are high because Count Dracula has the power to turn good old English people into vampires like himself. As indeed he does with poor Lucy, who was such a nice English rose before she was uh, bitten. Now, Dracula also deals with the conflicts arising from rapid industrialization. Victorian London is a modern city where people have abandoned their traditional beliefs and superstitions. But perhaps they have forgotten what links them to the past far too quickly. And the presence of Count Dracula will force them to re-establish at least some of those links with the past. But Dracula is a lot more than that. And it is impossible to talk about this novel without going into uh, what it has to say about female sexuality. First of all, the female characters in this novel, mostly Minna and Lucy, are flat. They come across more like a male fantasy rather than as real women. They also represent that Victorian uh, female ideal. Victorian values, uh, you know, were very strict when it came to gender and sexuality. There was this notion of purity that women had to preserve, you know. So for women, sex was reserved for marriage and with the sole purpose of reproduction. So, you know, sex before or outside marriage or, God forbid, sex between women was out of the question. The fact is that Victorians feared uh, female sexuality, 
there are clear remnants of that still now, unfortunately, but things were a lot worse in the 19th century for women. So when Lucy becomes a vampire in the novel and she also becomes sexually active, that behavior is not only deemed unacceptable, but it is one of the main reasons she must be destroyed. And of course, religion. Specifically, Christianity plays a central role in this novel. England is a Christian nation and religion was a lot more important to Victorians than it is uh, to many of us now. Okay, another horror story from that time is uh, The Strange Case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde by the Scottish writer Robert Louis Stevenson. Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde was first published in January 1886 and it is another novel that deals with some of the fears that Victorians had which maybe at least to some extent our fears now. Now this novel is mainly about human duality. Um, Stevenson is interested in exploring what he sees as two aspects of human identity, one mostly good and the other one evil. Of course he takes this to extremes by, by making Mr. Hyde a murderer, but that's also what makes this uh, novel fun to read, as long as you are into horror of course. But if you prefer mystery, then your Victorian writer should be Wilkie Collins. I have read that he's often thought of as the first mystery or detective fiction writer in English. His novel The Woman in White was a huge success in the 19th century and if you are into detective fiction and have an interest in Victorian literature, you need to read this novel. It has all the ingredients of the genre and a very, very tight plot that I'm just not going to say anything about. Now, The Woman in White was originally published in installments, once again, in this case between 1859 and, 50, and 60, 59 and 60, in a magazine named All Year Round, which was owned and run by Charles Dickens. If you're someone who reads novels mainly for their plot and wants to be mesmerized by a mystery taking place in the 19th century, this is the novel for you then. And if you like The Woman in White, then you should go on to read The Moonstone by the same author. The title refers to a yellow diamond uh, that is sacred to the Hindus. A general of the British army steals the diamond and takes it to England. Many years later, the general's niece gets the diamond on her 18th birthday, but later, on that very same day, the diamond is stolen and thus begins one of the finest detective novels ever written, according to many people. But now let's change gears and talk about less sensationalist books, okay? One of my favorite Victorian novels is North and South by Elizabeth Gaskell. This novel was first published in 1854 and it deals head on with industrialization and the English cultural divide between North and South. Now, the novel uh, North and South is set mainly in the north of England in a fictional city named Milton that clearly stands for the real city of Manchester. It is telling that the protagonist Margaret Hale is a southerner who is horrified by the effects of the Industrial Revolution in the north. At that time, parts of the north of England were a lot more industrialized than the south. The author, Gaskell, paints the north of England in a very negative light. It is smoky and dirty, and that contrasts with the idyllic rural south. So the novel deal, deals with those um, cultural differences between the north and south that were brought on uh, with the advent of the Industrial Revolution, but not only. I lived in the south of England for many, many years, and every time I went north to places like Manchester or Leeds, or even to Birmingham, which isn't even in the north, it's in the Midlands, I would feel like I was visiting almost another country. So there are still noticeable cultural differences between the north and the south of England. Now, many differences, many of those differences, no doubt preceded the Industrial Revolution, they're probably older, but it's interesting to see Gaskell's vision on the whole situation at her very specific time. North and South is also an example of the social novel, and uh, a more famous uh, example of that is probably Hard Times by Charles Dickens, which I think m more people read. But what is interesting about North and South is how its protagonist, Margaret, who isn't 
very nice at the beginning evolves you know she learns to appreciate the north and even grows sympathetic to the people she meets there there is also of course something about social class here because while most northern people she meets are uh, working class margaret herself is middle class so this is a fish out of water narrative as well one that tries to include a social message and i'm just not sure about how successful it is at marrying those two things but i think it is well worth reading however if you want something more universally acclaimed then i have three suggestions for great victorian classics for you classic novels okay so the first one is test of the d'urbervilles by the english writer thomas hardy from 1891 so thomas hardy's books are not for everyone okay if you want something cheerful with a happy ending you should steer clear not only from Tess but also from all the other novels by Thomas Hardy Hardy is probably the most pessimistic writer in English so I think it is fair to warn people about that because if you go in not knowing that you might not have fun uh, reading this novel so the protagonist, Tess uh, Derbyfield, Derby is a young poor woman from the country. One day, Tess's father gets it into his head that they are related to the wealthy Derbyville family, and off goes Tess to the Derbyville's mansion. From that point on, Tess's life will be a succession of misfortunes, one after the other, but each worse than the one before. So I am tempted to say that Tess of the D'Urbervilles is misreporn, but of course it is better than that. I think this novel explores many interesting themes actually. There is definitely a feminist reading of this novel because Tess's many misfortunes are one way or another the result of men's domination that ran rampant in Victorian society. Even if some of the men's intentions are good, they end up screwing up Tess. But also, there is this pervasive theme that life is unfair. Something that is also there in Hardy's other great novel, Jude the Obscure, a novel that I could have easily included in this video. So if you wanna go deep into a pessimistic worldview that explores the injustices of life, you could do a lot worse than to read Tess of the D'Urbervilles or any other novel by Thomas Hardy for that matter. Tess of the D'Urbervilles is not a complex novel and it focuses on a small cast of characters. But if you want to get a wider picture of Victorian society, then Middlemarch by uh, the English novelist George Eliot is a microcosm of such a society. George Eliot is a serious writer uh, who writes about serious subjects. Her real name was Marian Evans, but she was critical of novels written by women at the time, or lady novelists, as she referred to them. And she was determined to be a serious writer who was taken seriously. So she decided to use a male pen name, uh, George Eliot. And because that was her decision, her books are still published as George Eliot's books to this day. If I wanted to talk about her personal life, I would refer to her as Marian Evans, of course, but because all I want to talk about is her fiction, I will refer to her as George Eliot. So Middlemarch is a serious novel. It is a tour de force that reads like nothing else from Victorian literature. This novel stands out, uh, which is why it has become a classic and people continue reading it to this day. Middlemarch is also the product of a complex mind of the complex mind of an intellectual you can see what a learned scholar george Eliot was from all the references she makes to other works of literature and science the problem is that many of those references are so obscure that they went over my head i would say that i enjoy middlemarch despite all the illusions and not because of them Actually, I would say that Middlemarch is a novel I admire more than I enjoy reading, if you see what I mean. I think George Eliot was trying to prove that she could be as intellectually accomplished as any male writer, or maybe 
even more and she definitely succeeds at that here in Middlemarch. Instead of writing a romance novel that ends with marriage as it would have been expected from lady novelists at the time, George Eliot wrote a novel which she goes to great lengths to uh, talk about marriage in the most realistic, less idealistic possible way. As a result, there are or there is more than one unhappy marriage in Middlemarch. In this novel, many characters make wrong choices, not only when it comes to love and marriage, but also when it comes to work and their careers. And I suppose that those bad choices are the reason so many people like Middlemarch so much. The stuff that George Eliot uh, writes about still affects us. Despite the 19th century uh, setting, this novel is relevant to us. Middlemarch is probably the most modern novel of the Victorian lot. It could almost be a contemporary novel set in Victorian times. Apart from giving us characters that make uh, poor choices and must deal with their consequences, Middlemarch is also a novel that contains different, almost equally important plots. So for instance, there is no single protagonist many of the characters are equally important. In Middlemarch, George Eliot paints a picture of life in a provincial town in England, so she has not only to include but also give equal attention to many different characters. And this was highly unusual in 19th century, 19th century English literature. All the other novels that I have discussed in this video um, have a very clear protagonist and a fairly straightforward plot, but in Middlemarch the action is shared by male and female characters from different walks of life. And that is what I think makes this novel a tour de force, as I said earlier. Now I have reviewed Middlemarch here on my channel, so I'm going to link to that video here, up here somewhere, in case you haven't seen it yet and are interested to find out more. But let me just say that if you want to read just one Victorian novel, you should read uh, Middlemarch because it is the greatest one, head and shoulders above the rest. As I said earlier, the list of great Victorian novels could go on and on and on, but let me know what your favorite Victorian novels are in the comment section down below. Thank you so much for watching. I hope that you've enjoyed this video and I'll see you again very soon in my next video. Take care.